bit of uh, background. So I'm an orthopaedic surgeon in practice in Sydney, but also now have an academic practice. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to be telling you comes from these uh, two books. The first one I wrote in 2016, the second one more recently with Rochelle Bookbinder, who's a very highly regarded musculoskeletal researchers, researcher. And there's a, um, a message in there that I, I want to get out. Now, there's a side note first. You're going to see this picture many times during the presentation, and I'm going to use it as an example of many different things or messages that I want to get across. Now, this is a uh, picture from a publication of a trial called the Fidelity Trial, which was a very famous um, placebo-controlled trial of knee arthroscopy, keyhole surgery in the knee for a torn meniscus, a degenerative tear of the meniscus. And it was performed by Finnish researchers. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine as the lead article, and I remember it so well. It was December 26, 2013. Um, and it's a, um, famous for being very high quality study. But I'm going to use, you've lost the picture, but I haven't, there it is. I'm going to use this for many reasons, and I'm just going to show you what we're talking about. There's two lines here. They're hard to see because they overlap. One is the real surgery. One is the placebo surgery. And they follow each other, so the outcome is similar. This is a knee score where higher scores are better. This is before the surgery, immediately before the surgery, and then two months, six months, 12 months afterwards. And you can see that both groups improved, and that's an important thing. So that's what this picture shows. You'll see the picture again. So what is the message in um, a lot of my writing, and the message I'm going to try and get across to you today, is that there's a lack of science in medicine. And when I say lack of science, I don't mean necessarily that um, there's a lack of, of volume, but there is. <coughs> but there's also a lack of scientific rigor. And this surprises a lot of people, particularly lay people, because they see medicine as a scientific endeavor. Doctors push medicine as a scientific endeavor. But it's not. If we were to get, uh, sorry, if we were to get a famous scientist such as uh, uh, Richard Feynman or someone and resurrect him and come out and look at what we do in medicine, they would be shocked at what we do. We have our own people like that. John Ioannidis has written many times about the problems with modern medicine. And the lack of science and lack of scientific rigor leads us as clinicians and by proxy the public to overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms of what we do. And these cycle on each other, these first two points cycle on each other. Because we believe that it works, we think we don't need to do the science. And so the science gets done, and we continue to believe it works. This leads to overtreatment. This is one of the reasons for overtreatment. There's lots of reasons for overtreatment, which I'll cover. And the answer to this is to have better science. So let's talk about the benefits and harms. And let's start with an overview of the harms. This is a, a picture from uh, the New Yorker from some time ago. First, do no harm. After that, go nuts. And to me, it's a real sign of uh, the problems with overtreatment. There's a thing in medicine called the 60-30-10 um, rule, where roughly 60% of what we do is evidence-based and uh, beneficial. 30% is low value, and 10% is actually harmful. It's a net harm for the people. And this is a surprisingly robust figure. And it's been shown in many studies, including Australia, um, uh, um, uh, Canada, US, uh, and in um, middle income and lower income countries as well. And you can look up any of these, but it's, it's always somewhere between sort of 9% and 11%. It's a very consistent figure of the harm that we're doing. And in fact, in... Um, BMJ, it was listed as the third leading cause of death in this particular article, where they estimate that between 250,000 and 400,000 deaths occur in the US alone um, due to 
a medical error. But the usual view is, well, those harms don't apply to me. Um, those numbers are too high. That's just, the, that's just the price we pay for the benefits of modern medicine. Sure, some people are going to die along the way, but think of what modern medicine has given us. Um, but then not only are the harms underestimated, people just don't believe these harms, these shocking numbers. It's just dismissed. But the benefits are overestimated. And so here we have life expectancy, and we've all seen graphs like this before. This is nothing new. We know that life expectancy has improved, particularly in the 20th century, where it went in the US from a little over 40 to a little, little over 70. A 30-year increase in life expectancy in 100 years. And most people attribute that to modern medicine. And in fact, when surveyed, that's exactly what they say. So the Centers for Disease Control did a survey in the US and they asked the public, how much of this increase in life expectancy is due to modern medical care? How much is due to sanitation? And the public say that 20% is due to public health and lifestyle measures. And without modern medicine, the life expectancy would be 47 today. The CDC says that 80% of the 30-year gain is due to public health measures, things like clean water, food storage, refrigeration, um, uh, better agriculture, reduction in smoking, increase in activity levels. And despite this period containing uh, the invention of antibiotics and modern medicine, 80% of that 30-year gain is due to prevention and public health measures, not due to... Um, antibiotics, for example. And to give you an example, in 1850, the largest killer in many countries was tuberculosis. And this graph here shows the decline in the mortality rate from tuberculosis. And you can see here, this is when antibiotics, sorry, this is when antibiotics were introduced, and already this is most of the decline. And even then, they weren't widely available. Um, similar things for other diseases. Most people think that these vaccines were responsible for the eradication of these diseases. Now, these vaccines work. I'm not an uh, anti-vaxxer. These vaccines are effective and these vaccines are keeping it down. But they aren't responsible for the fall to almost nothing before they came about. That's due to public health measures. And even more recently, in the 20th century, this is the decline we see in heart disease. And this was something I noted. I, I, it was the number one cause of death. It was not uncommon to suddenly die from a heart attack at even young ages. And this crashed from 1960 to 2000. Now, there's been many studies looking at why this is. And each of these studies has concluded that most of the decline in cardiac disease is due to prevention public health measures, decreases in the rate of smoking, increases in activity levels, and yes, decreases in mean blood pressure, probably due to treating blood pressure, but not due to coronary artery bypass grafts and the high intensity, high cost surgery. So we have this biased view, and it can be measured. It can be measured on specific conditions, and we did this in some studies where we looked at um, this example, joint replacement, hip and knee replacement, and we interviewed patients who'd had a hip or knee replacement and said, how satisfied are you with the outcome? And then we interviewed the surgeons of those patients and said, how satisfied are you with the outcome for that particular patient? And then we matched them. There's a significant discrepancy. There's also a significant discrepancy after trauma, believe it or not. This is after tibia fractures. We did the same thing. 66% of the surgeons felt that the outcome was satisfactory. 44% of the patients felt the outcome was satisfactory. So surgeons have a much higher estimate of how good their surgery is and a lower estimate of the harms, and yet they're the ones making the decisions. This has all been summarised in a study from uh, Bond University in Australia where they looked at all the studies comparing clinicians' expectations of the benefits and harms of treatment and screening compared to reality, compared to what tests actually show us. And they found that uh, practitioners consistently overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms of their own interventions. So it's been fairly well documented that we are biased. It's probably a human thing. Most endeavours 
people think that what they do is better than what other people do. Um, uh, if you go into a, um, uh, I was going to say a Toyota dealer, because that's the, my Australian thing, but here I have to say Audi dealer or something like that, they're going to think that their car is better than the, the other one, the BMW dealer. That's just what they honestly believe. But there's more evidence that there's something wrong, that there's overtreatment. And we can see this when we see inconsistencies. And there's inconsistencies in practice variation, and there's inconsistencies in, uh, revealed by second opinion studies. So practice variations, there's lots of these atlases of healthcare activity around the world. And this is a picture of spine fusion, lumbar spine fusion surgery in Australia, and each dot is a region of Australia. And there's a massive difference between the rate of spine surgery between these regions. This has been done in the US as well, where the largest predictor of whether or not you have a spine fusion surgery are things like your insurance status and the number of surgeons that live in your area. <laughs> um, we've shown another problem, and this is unique to Australia. Um, this is a study we're about to publish, and this is looking at the rate of Sp spine fusion surgery for low back pain, uh, which I would argue is not indicated. And there's two lines there, a blue and a red line. We're lucky in Australia we can do experiments like this because we have a real classic two-tiered system. We have universal health care, but we also have a um, flourishing private health industry and private insurance. And the blue line is public health sector and the red line is the private health sector. Um, and this has been shown in many other things as well, but particularly in spine surgery. So you can imagine what happens. A patient comes to a spine surgeon, and the, my spine, I used to be a spine surgeon, I gave it up. Um, my spine surgeon colleagues tell me that this is probably not far from the truth. A patient comes along with back pain. Now, there isn't very good evidence for fusing people with low back pain. So you can say to the patient as the surgeon, look, there isn't really very good evidence. I'm sorry that, that surgery is, is helpful in your condition. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have good supporting evidence. Uh, you're, you're better off probably just trying this alternative treatment or, or something else. Now, you, you would say that for a um, public patient. Now, a private patient comes in and you can say almost exactly the same thing. The evidence isn't very good. We don't know if spine fusion surgery is helpful in your situation or if it isn't. But the only way we'll find out is if we do it. And how about we give it a go? Um, and I think that that's largely what's happening. Second opinion studies are very interesting. This one published uh, from Brazil looked at patients who had been recommended to have spine surgery. And then they were sent for a second opinion. And most of the time, the second opinion differed to the first opinion. More than a third of them recommended against the surgery that had been recommended. And in 6% of them, it was thought that they had no spinal condition whatsoever. <laughs> this is not uncommon. Uh, and I've seen it in Australia too when um, we've had difficulties with waiting lists in some areas and patients for hip and knee replacement, knee replacement in particular, have been sent to another hospital for their surgery. They're on the waiting list, they're all ready to go, but there's, the waiting list is too long. Go and see the doctors in this other hospital. And when they see the doctors in the other hospital, they're cancelling between 15 and 20% of them, saying they don't need to have surgery. And yet they're already booked for it. So there's something wrong. There's another way we can show that there's overtreatment, and that's when treatment decreases. And this is uh, a study we published in New South Wales looking at the rates of uh, arthroscopic knee surgery, particularly for meniscus problems. Um, and we found a near 50% reduction between 2011 2018. Uh, there is similar evidence from. Um, my colleagues uh, um, in the room uh, from Denmark, and it's very similar. This 2010-2011 this fall. Um, so that's evidence that we were doing too much. I can show you similar graphs 
for prostatectomy, for prostate cancer, because it was being overdone, because it was being overdiagnosed. Um, but so far I've only talked about treatments. The same thing goes for screening to try and detect disease. And this is a difficult concept to get across because for most people, when you say, oh, screening can be terrible, if we screen for disease, that can be really bad, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't gel. It's counterintuitive because how does getting more information, I mean, a screening test basically gives you information that you didn't have beforehand. How can more information be harmful? And there's lots of examples of this, and there's lots of debates in the world of cancer screening, uh, including uh, breast cancer screening and other major cancers. But the example I've chosen is thyroid cancer in Korea, because in South Korea, around the um, turn of the century, around uh, 1999, they brought in a program where they said, well, we want to start screening for cancers because we want to you know, lower the mortality from cancer. Cancer's bad, and if we pick it up, that's good. And the doctors at the time said, yeah, and uh, thyroid cancer should be one of them. So they started screening for thyroid cancer by doing ultrasounds of the thyroid. And this was very profitable for them because often the GPs did the ultrasound or owned the ultrasound machine, and so they were ultrasounding everybody. And in the period of about 18 years, the incidence of thyroid cancer in South Korea increased 15-fold and it became the most common cancer diagnosed in the country. It's not even close to the most common cancer in other countries. And of course, once diagnosed, it got treated. It got treated with thyroidectomy. So once the thyroid has been removed, you're on lifetime thyroid hormone replacement the complications of removing the thyroid is that often you accidentally remove the parathyroid glands, requiring lifetime replacement of those hormones and consequent problems. There's an 11% incidence of that. There's a 2% incidence of vocal cord paralysis and a few deaths. So this is what happened in Korea over that time. That's the thyroid cancer incidence. They were diagnosing papillary thyroid cancer and papillary thyroid cancer is probably present in a lot of people in this room right now. It's the kind of cancer that you die with, you don't die of. But they were treating it. And look at the bottom line. The bottom line is what happened to thyroid cancer mortality. It didn't change one bit. So the argument here is that untold cost and harms were caused on tens of thousands of people who were diagnosed with thyroid cancer unnecessarily. So this is how screening can be harmful. And it's another example of too much medicine. So why do doctors get it wrong? Well, there's lots of reasons why they get it wrong, but there's one reason I want to concentrate on for this particular talk. And that's this problem, and I particularly think it's a problem in surgery, but it is a problem in medicine in general, is that we rely more on our observation, on observational evidence, or in fact, what we observe, what we see with our own eyes, rather than some scientific experiment like a randomized trial. But, but this is very human. It's normal to believe what you see and not what someone else did somewhere else that counters your opinion. So let's look at this. Um, this is. Uh, an image downloaded from a website that you can look at that's, that's uh, a correlation is not causation. And you see two lines go together. One is ice cream sales, one is polio cases in 1949. Immediately when you see this graph, you start looking for connections. That is a human response. You start thinking, oh, well, maybe the polio virus was contaminating the ice cream. There, that's a, that's, that's a logical explanation. If not, well, maybe... It's easy to think up biologically plausible mechanisms for anything. Um, you know, maybe the ice cream makes, uh, lowers the temperature of the throat and allows the, the virus to enter uh, easier. There's lots of things you can think of without realising that, of course, both of these things peak in summer. So this is an example of... Um, 
uh, a logical fallacy. And it's similar, and here's our picture here. Um, when doctors treat people with uh, uh, degenerative menisci in their knee and knee pain, they don't see the two lines. They only see the blue line, which is the surgical line. And they see people improve after their surgery, because that's what happens. People improve after you operate on them. And so they attribute that improvement to the operation they did. That's only logical, and I put logical in air quotes there. Um, and that's the logical fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc, which it means it follows, therefore it is because of. And it's a very common logical fallacy. So we're going to look into that a little bit deeper. So this is the perceived effectiveness of surgery. Surgeons perceive it to be effective because my patients get better. So post hoc ergo propter hoc, I would argue that a lot of it is due to natural history, regression to the mean and concomitant treatment. What do I mean by natural history? It's what would have happened anyway. Um, there's lots of examples of this, but the example I like to use involves Archibald Cochrane, after whom the Cochrane collaboration is named who, as a prisoner of war under the Germans in World War II, was in charge of something like 20,000 captured soldiers um, and no medicine and no doctors. And they had diseases, they had uh, dysentery, open wounds, they were terribly sick and malnourished. And he thought he was going to lose about half of them. He thought there were going to be thousands of dead without medical care. And he asked his German captors for doctors, you must let us have doctors. And the German captors in my best German said, Ärzte sind überflüssig, which means doctors are superfluous, I believe. Um, and he was shocked at this. He looked after these men for six months. And of the 10 or 20,000 he looked after, four died, three were shot trying to escape. And he couldn't believe it that they just got better anyway. And when he got back to England, he started challenging the current beliefs. And the current belief at that time was that if you had a heart attack, you had to lie in bed for a week. You weren't allowed to get up bed rest for one week after a heart attack. And they did this because people got better after their heart attack. And it must have been because they were in bed. And he said, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why don't we just get them to walk around? And how dare you, are going to be killing them. You will be killing people by getting them up to walk around. And of course now we know that getting them up and walking around is better than lying them in bed for a week. But at the time it was just the, the mindset. But he started challenging things. Um, regression to the mean is where we take people who are at the extremes from a group uh, and then we know that next time we measure them, they'll be closer to the mean. So this is uh, my rough drawing of the pain levels of a patient who has uh, a bit of osteoarthritis in the knee. And they don't have the same pain every minute of every day. Um, sometimes it's very bad. Uh, and then they have a period where it's not so bad. But then after that, it's bad again. Um, now, if we see patients when they're bad, if a patient comes to me and says, my knee's pretty bad, I'll operate on them then. Now, what happens after I operate on them? They get better. Sometimes they don't get better. And I've seen surgeons who have operated on people here. They've come back a couple of weeks later and said, how's your knee? And the patient says, well, it's not much better. It's still really sore. And the surgeon says, that's OK. Sometimes it takes the surgery a little while to work. Um, and then he sees them another three weeks later, and of course, they're better. And, of course, we don't operate on people here. Otherwise, they'd get worse. And concomitant treatment, and this example is a complicated uh, title there, but it's a drug that was developed some time ago now, um, bone morphogenetic protein, we're going to call it BMP. And in the orthopaedic world, this was gold. This was the holy grail. And particularly for me as a trauma surgeon, trying to get bones to heal, this was it. It was um, developed by, um, uh, uh, um, in the lab um, to mimic uh, the body's bone morphogenic protein. And if you take this and you inject it into a rat, 
where you inject turns into a bone. It basically forms bone. It's a miracle. And so the company wanted to get this listed by the FDA, and so they did a study. And this is the study they did. And it was on the basis of this single study that the drug was approved by the FDA in the US and then spread around the world, and the company made billions of dollars off this drug. Now, that was about 20 years ago. I should tell you now, we don't use this drug because it doesn't work. But at the time, it looked like it worked. Now, what they did, if you read the whole title, is they had people who had a non-union. They had a bone that hadn't healed. There's a gap between the two ends of the bone, and it hadn't joined. And it hadn't joined for nine months. And that, to me, means that it's pretty much a non-union. The probability of it healing if you do nothing is very low. So they put in injected bone morphogenic protein in one group. And in the other group, they did the traditional bone graft, which is what we normally do. We take some bone from the hip and we put it in the fracture and that often gets it to heal. And the healing rate was about 75% with the BMP, 80% with the bone graft, but pretty close. And on the basis of that, they said BMP is as good as bone graft. It's approved and it was used everywhere. The problem was... Nearly every one of the patients had something else done in both groups. They had their fixation, their, their rod, their nail, whatever it was holding the bone together that wasn't working, taken out. They had the canal of the tibia reamed out and had a new nail put in. And that's what we call exchange nailing. Sorry for these timing problems. Um, now, that's called exchange nailing. If you have a tibial non-union and you do exchange nailing and nothing else, the union rate's about 85%. So if anything, it looked to me as if maybe BMP was hampering the union a little bit, but it certainly wasn't adding anything to what they were already getting. But, uh, you know... The FDA still approved it. So why do we still intervene? Why do doctors still operate when we're talking about surgeons? Is it because they believe it to be effective? Is it because of patient demand? This is often thrown at me. They say, well, um, the patient wanted to have surgery. Well, that's well and good, but um, that doesn't mean that you should give them an ineffective operation. And they go, well, how do you deal with it when a patient says that they want to have surgery? I say, well, I... In the case of knee arthroscopy, I tell them that the evidence is that it's no better than if I pretended to do it, and it won't help them. And then the patient says, well, I'm not an idiot, then I, I don't want to have surgery. It's not that hard to explain concepts like that. Another common concept among surgeons is this failure of non-operative treatment. And when I was arguing the case once at a meeting about knee arthroscopy, one senior surgeon got up and said, what you fail to realise is that these patients have failed non-operative treatment. Therefore, they need operative treatment. Now, when you say it like that, it sounds logical. Most of you in the room have probably read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, and if you're thinking fast, well, they've failed non-operative treatment, they need operative treatment. That makes sense. I just don't think about it for any longer than that. If you think about it for a few more seconds, you realise that if you have an operation that doesn't work, the failure of any other procedure doesn't make it work. It just doesn't work. Lack of alternatives, and surgeons have said to me, well, if I can't do a knee arthroscopy, then you're telling me I have to do knee replacements on all of these patients. And that's a bigger operation, a more costly operation, because they don't understand that they, there is an option of not doing any operation at all that's often overlooked. And the other thing is, um, after this paper came out, going back to the fidelity study, I had dinner with a surgeon who I said, well, what about that paper? That was a, that was a big deal. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing more arthroscopies than ever. And I said, well, you've got my attention. Um, can, you, can you now explain yourself? And he said, I don't care. Well, I don't care if I'm on the blue line or the red line. Because both of them get better. Um, but... Even though some of these have been used as excuses, I think that, on the whole, it's this belief in effectiveness, this misplaced belief, which really drives us on, unfortunately, because that's the hardest thing to shift. 
And this is how doctors think when faced with a study like the Fidelity study. This is a quote from a journal. Doctors are not prepared to discard therapies validated by both tradition and their own experience on account of someone else's numbers. So observation trumps experimentation. That's what they're saying. And this is not new. This is the way doctors think now, and this is the way doctors thought in 1836. <laughs> Pierre Louis very famously did a scientific study of bloodletting for pneumonia. And bloodletting had been the mainstay of medical treatment for 2,000 years. They know it worked. They just argued about how to do it, how much blood you should let, when, early, often, infrequently, on a full moon, wh whatever. It, you, 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 the science was about how to do it, not about whether it worked or not. And it was when Pierre Louis did the study where he was looking at the timing and the amount of bloodletting and whether if you did it straight away after pneumonia or you did it a few days later or you did it a week later. And he put all this data together and he found out, wow, the less you do it and the later you do it, the better it is. So the patients were more likely to die if they had more bloodlet and if they had it done sooner. And so extrapolating, he said, if we don't do it at all, that's going to be the best result. Uh, but this was the reaction. You know, this is a study by someone in another country. We know what works. So who are the blood letters of today? Um, this has been looked at. This is published in The Lancet um, a few years back now. But uh, you don't need to read it. The writing's deliberately too small. There's lots of things. Um, Overtreatment is very well recognised in many circles of medicine, but it's not well recognised by the average doctor, unfortunately, and it's not well recognised by the public. And it's one of the reasons why I give lectures like this. But it is appreciated that BMJ has a series called Too Much Medicine. Uh, JAMA um, has a Less Is More um, series. And there's the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference, which is now in its, I'm guessing, ninth or 10th or 11th year. Um, and next year it's in Denmark. So feel free to attend. And another example before we go on and talk a bit more about um, placebos is knee replacement. Now, knee replacement, I've chosen an example because it is effective. Um, now, it's only ever been subjected to one RCT. Um, and I'm pleased to let you know that the authors of this RCT are in the room. Um, but it is, it is effective. There, there is a role for this operation. So it's not like procedures that don't work at all, that only have a placebo. This actually has an effect, but again, the benefit is overestimated. We've shown that the benefit's overestimated. And this is the highest cost, cost procedure in Australia. This one procedure is the number one cost procedure. It's about one and a half percent of the health budget in Australia. It goes to total knee replacement alone. And we're happy to pay that, but we're not happy to pay for anything that will prevent it. We don't pay for exercise programs that may prevent it, and we don't pay for weight loss programs that might prevent it. And an interesting study was published only this year from Melbourne looking at bariatric surgery for obese patients awaiting a total knee replacement. These patients are booked for total knee replacement. End-stage osteoarthritis, you need to have your knee replaced, and you happen to be morbidly obese. So they randomised them. Half of them had bariatric surgery to uh, get weight loss before their surgery, and the other was treatment as usual. The hypothesis was that it would reduce the complications of the surgery that had already been booked and was deemed necessary. And it did lower the complications. But what they found was that 29%, 29% of the patients who had the bariatric surgery cancelled their knee replacement because their knee was better. They didn't need to have the surgery. So there's lots of effective things we can do other than just replacing knees. But the medical system we have is a perverse system. It is full of perverse incentives. And I would argue it's not fit for purpose. It measures and rewards health care activity. It doesn't measure or reward health. 
So this is where we are. Now, there's lots of other reasons why doctors are biased towards treatment. There's this psychological phenomenon that doctors think that if they don't provide a treatment, that this is somehow a, a, a failure of caring um, or a failure inherent in the doctor. Interventions are incentivized, as we know, uh, not in all systems. And this is why the spine fusion rate in the US is far higher than the spine fusion rate in the UK, despite similar populations. Um, but there's a simplistic appeal of, well, let's just do it. Let's just get it done. Um, and there is a lack of scientific rigor. So we, whenever there's uncertainty, we bias towards assuming that what we do works. But the drivers of overtreatment have been documented in this article in the BMJ. Again, you deliberately can't read every line there. Um, but there's lots of things. Fear of litigation is one. And that's been shown. Doctors will admit that they often um, err towards too much treatment, too many tests, because they're worried that they might miss something and get into trouble. So let's go to surgery. Unfortunately, what usually drives surgery is possibly some lab evidence, but usually observational studies. Surgery lives off observational studies, and most new operations that get introduced get introduced based on observational studies. We did the operation and the patient got better without comparing it to a control. Of course, what we should use is the method with the least error, so a low bias experiment. We don't do that. Um, we looked at the randomised trial support for orthopaedic surgery in three hospitals in Sydney, around nine or 10,000 procedures. We found that about 50% of the procedures had been subjected to an RCT comparing doing the operation to not doing the operation. That's actually not an unusual number, and a lot of medical practice has about 50% support. Interestingly, in the RCTs, that did compare doing the procedure to not doing the procedure, only about half of them showed benefit and half showed no benefit. So there's an evidence gap. The top line is an evidence gap. We don't have evidence for a lot of what we do. There's uncertainty, so we do it anyway. But there's an evidence practice gap. where We have evidence that a lot of what we do doesn't work, but we do it anyway. We did a similar study looking at uh, surgery for chronic musculoskeletal pain. We looked at the 15 most common operations performed. Similar studies have been done uh, in uh, Denmark, again acknowledging um, uh, authors in the room and uh, in the UK. We took a slightly different angle. We wanted to look at the proportion of RCTs that compared, of all RCTs that compared doing the procedure to not doing the procedure and the proportion of those that were favourable to surgery. Um, meaning statistically significant and clinically important. So we had these 15 procedures. I'm not going to go through them all. I'll just show you one. This is rotator cuff repair, which is uh, repairing the tendons in the shoulder, which is normally a degenerative problem, a little bit like the knee. We found um, when we just looked at the heading rotator cuff, that was our search strategy, slash rotator cuff, we found there's been 312 RCTs. Four of those RCTs compared doing it to not doing it. Isn't this a bit like bloodletting? All of the RCTs that have been done, nearly all of them, are looking at how to do it, not whether it works or not. Only one was favourable and none of them were blinded. So overall, we found thousands of RCTs, but less than 1% of all RCTs for those 15 most common operations compared doing it to not doing it. So 99% of what we do is working out how to do it, not finding out if it works or not. Because only 15% of those comparative studies were favourable to surgery. 85% of them were not. We did find 9% of those RCTs were blinded, where the patients were blinded. That was interesting. It was interesting because none of them were favourable to surgery. So now we're getting into the area of placebos in surgery. And I have to explain what I'm talking about. Overall, we operate on someone, we see them get better. That's the perceived therapeutic effect. Now, that's a combination of the specific therapeutic effect of the anatomical change that the surgery did, the removal of the meniscus, for example, the repairing of the rotator cuff tendon. But there's also these non-specific effects, which is the bit to the right. 
Now, those non-specific effects are made up of lots of things, and I've already explained that I think a lot of it is just natural history, what would happen anyway, regression to the mean, concomitant treatment, the physio they get after the rotator cuff repair, for example. Um, but perhaps some of it is placebo as well, um, and due to other difficult to measure contextual effects. So historically where it all started, um, the first placebo study of surgery was actually a long time ago. This is 1959. And this was a procedure to treat angina, or cardiac disease. And now they knew that angina was due to a lack of blood supply to the heart. So they did an operation where they would make an incision in the chest and tie off, ligate, the internal mammary artery, which is a branch of an artery that also feeds the heart. The idea was that once they tied off the vessel, blood would not flow through it, and therefore more blood would flow to the heart. They actually went to the extent of doing this experiment in dogs, and they found out when they tied it off, the blood didn't flow through, and it went elsewhere. I don't think they really needed to do that, but they did. And so they started doing this. This was a common operation in the US for 20 years until this study was done. And what they did was very brave for 1959. They did an incision in all of the patients, put a ligature around the artery in every single patient, tied it in half of them and didn't tie it off in the other half and found that patients got better anyway. But there's a problem with this study because the conclusion of the study was that we have shown that surgery has a very strong placebo effect. So they think it was the placebo effect of the surgery that made people better. But people get better after an attack of angina, after a, an infarct. That's what happens. It's like the, the week of bed rest that Cochrane saw. And they didn't realise that what they were looking at was probably natural history, not a placebo effect. But because people got better after they did it, even in the placebo group, they assumed it was because of what they did in the placebo. Post hoc ergo propter hoc, a logical fallacy that keeps popping up. Lots of other studies have been done since then. Um, again, they noticed that both groups get better. It's this picture that I keep showing you. Um, transplanting cells into the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. No better than pretending to do it. Um, shoulder pain, there's been uh, two placebo-controlled RCTs and then in knee pain, of course, um, this is the fidelity study at the top and there's another one, oh, so at the bottom and then on the top is another one also published in New England Journal showing um, the same improvement with placebo and without. Even with these studies, there's bias in the way we perceive them. We published this in 2017 in the BMJ Unfortunately, for arthroscopic meniscectomy, there has been more systematic reviews than there has been RCTs. This is not uncommon, particularly in an area where it's considered controversial. However, when we published this, there was so much evidence, not just the placebo studies, but non-placebo studies, showing that it didn't work. None of the studies showed it worked. Our conclusion was it doesn't work, and further research is not required. <laughs> That's very important. We said that it's, it's done. It's done. We don't need to do any more research because it's so consistent. Another systematic review on the same topic was published in what I will kindly call a lesser journal. Um, one of my least favourite journals, I, I won't name it. Um, and it was called The Urgent Need for Evidence in Arthrosc Arthroscopic Meniscal Surgery. So they did a systematic review of the same thing. What did they find? Well, it was pretty hard not to find that no difference was found between arthroscopic meniscal debridement compared with non operative management. It just doesn't work. So their conclusion, and this is a quote, this is their conclusion from the systematic review that found consistent evidence that all of the studies show that this doesn't work. The conclusion is more research is urgently needed to support meniscal surgery because we as surgeons know that it works and we're sick of seeing all of these studies to show that it doesn't. It's observational evidence over experimental evidence. And they keep coming. They say, well, those studies don't apply to us. We know which patients will get better. 
So we designed a study where we gave surgeons scenarios lifted from an actual study and said, here's the patient's MRI, here's their age, this is what their meniscus tear looks like, this is their history, this is the amount of degeneration. Will this one get better with surgery or not? How would you treat this one? The, we interviewed lots of surgeons, lots of cases, no better than chance. They had no idea who was going to get better and who wasn't. They can't predict it. And to top it all off, after that fidelity study was published, was an editorial by the editor of Arthroscop Arthroscopy Journal, who in response to the placebo-controlled study said, patients who may not be of entirely sound mind are selected, and research performed on such individuals would not be generalizable to mentally healthy patients. So we can talk about the ethics of placebo surgical trials. I think this is not a big deal anymore, but originally people were saying, well, surgical trials are unethical. I think people are still saying it. My daughter has just graduated as a nurse, and they discussed an article, and interestingly, they discussed the Fidelity trial in their little journal club, and this is the placebo-controlled trial. And, and she, of course, knew about it. She's heard my lectures, and I tell anyone who wants to listen, because I love that trial. Um, and so, but she just sat there very quietly, because the consensus at the end of the journal club, and this was like a few weeks ago, um, was that, well, it should never have been done because surgical trials are unethical. Um, surgical placebo trials are unethical. But still, people think that, but they're not. They're confusing the ethics of clinical practice, which is, says you shouldn't be doing something to someone unless it's going to help them, with the ethics of research, which means you need to do the best scientific study you can. You need to minimise the harm. Patients need to agree to the study, etc. all of the ethical requirements, but it has to be balanced by a potential benefit to society. So clinical practice is balancing the risks and benefits to an individual patient. Research ethics balances the benefits on a larger scale. And so now it's usual that these studies get approved by ethics committees very quickly because they're of such high scientific quality. Um, and the risks are overstated. The, this is a review of all placebo surgical trials and it showed, again, initially counterintuitive, but when you think about it, it makes sense, that in placebo-controlled trials, the harms are less in the placebo group. You're less likely to be harmed. And when you think about it, that's because you're having less done to you. It's a less invasive procedure. But the risks to society of continued surgery are underestimated. We know we underestimate the risks. So let me give you a hypothetical scenario. We have a procedure X. Let's call it, I don't know, spine fusion. You could call it um, the arthroscopy, whatever. What are the ethics? Balance the ethics of this. Firstly, doing a study, taking one or 200 patients, expose them to a 50% chance of having treatment X or no treatment. But in doing that study, we will find out if it works or not. So we will know whether this treatment is effective. That's the ethics of doing the study. The ethics of not doing the study is that we continue the practice of this procedure indefinitely into the future with all the costs and associated harms and uncertainty and we just don't know if it works. Is placebo necessary? Well, we recently, this is just this year, published this um, and discussed it in Journal Club yesterday, looking at the placebo effect in surgery. And there, there may be some case for some conditions, particularly with short-term outcomes, that there is a placebo effect. But in the longer term, I think that most of it is due to natural history, regression to the mean, etc. And when you think about it, this is always hard to communicate because placebos, by definition, have no effect. That's, that's what makes it a placebo. If it had an effect, it would be a treatment, not a placebo. So it's what is it about the context in which the placebo is delivered. Um, but a lot of talk is made of this. That people think that placebos are wonderful and there's studies showing that um, it's fantastic. Look at the, the, uh, uh, the type of placebo. And that top picture there has got the red placebo, the blue placebo. And this is commonly quoted saying, well, red ones are more active than blue ones. 
Okay, this is a study from a long time ago that uh, randomized 22 patients, five of whom got the red placebo. This is not really good science. And there's this confusion of within group to between group change. And I'm showing you that picture again from the fidelity study because they're seeing the red line alone. They're seeing the red line and they're saying that's the placebo effect. Without knowing what would have happened anyway, you haven't teased out the natural history. Um, and this Cochrane review showed that um, there's very little um, uh, actual effect. In dichotomous outcomes, none. In uh, continuous outcomes for pain, one point on a 10-point scale. And there's bias in these open-label placebo studies. So this study here at the bottom has often been uh, quoted as showing a long-term effect of placebo, five years. But if you look at this study, they only followed the open-label placebo group. They didn't follow the other group. This is a case series. This is not an RCT, showing that people are still better five years later. Well, they could have been still better five years later if you'd have done nothing, and they probably would have. So when to use a placebo? You don't have to use it all the time. If your outcome is a radiographic outcome, if your outcome is mortality, you don't need a placebo. You only need a placebo when blinding is important, when patient reported outcomes such as pain are being reported. And so the advantage of, of placebos is that it's, it, it's a blinding tool. That's all it is. It reduces bias, so it's better science. Because it's better science, it has more impact as well. And when this study came out in 2013, it caused uh, absolute panic amongst surgeons. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody knew about this paper. It was such a high impact paper. And just to show you how good placebo surgery is at reducing bias and isolating the intervention, I'm giving you a map here of a study we're currently recruiting to in Australia called the ARC trial, which is looking at rotator cuff repair in the shoulder. Both groups are treated exactly the same. Both groups are getting arthroscopy. Both groups are having other things done in their shoulder, such as debridement, decompression, and whatever. Only when those things are finished in the operating room are patients randomised. And randomization is brought as close to the intervention as possible, which, as we know, is good science. Less things can happen to them in between, so there's less crossovers, etc. And then they're randomized to have the cuff repair or not, and then afterwards the physiotherapy is exactly the same. The patients are blinded. The surgeon that sees them afterwards is a different surgeon. The surgeon is blinded. Everyone is blinded. So you can see how placebo surgery can really narrow down and isolate the thing that you're interested in testing. There is a downside of placebo research, and that's the interpretation, how people interpret this. You know, oh, well, it works anyway. Let's just do it. And what is the placebo effect? It is very difficult to interpret these studies. And there is a cost and complexity involved if you're going to put a placebo um, in your study. Some people argue that recruitment is low, although we have just finished a study we're trying to get published, we just submitted the other day, um, comparing recruitment in placebo and non-placebo studies. In surgical trials, they're very similar. So it's hard to recruit for surgical trials, not necessarily placebo trials, so I rule that one out. So in summary, thank you for being so patient. Um, the, the benefits of medical care are overestimated. The harms are underestimated. I think that's been very clearly shown. This is one driver of overtreatment. There's a lot of drivers of overtreatment, but it's the one that, that is important because it's a fundamental sort of logical fallacy that we have. It's an unscientific way of practicing medicine. This is a result of and a cause of a lack of high quality evidence. So the lack of high quality evidence means there's uncertainty, so we assume it works. When we assume it works, we think that we don't need high quality evidence. It's a vicious cycle. High quality evidence in surgery in particular is not mandated. You don't have to do an RCT in surgery to get it listed for rebate in Australia and in many other countries. It's not incentivized. A surgeon in practice isn't going to do an RCT 
for no money, um, why would they do it? And even when they're done, they're not believed. So the solution is um, science-based medicine. We need to be more scientific. Doctors need to be more scientific. We need to demand more science. If a new pill is brought out by a drug company to introduce for a certain disease, it has to undergo quite rigorous comparative tests, sometimes placebo tests or alternative uh, drugs. But in surgery, that's not the case. We need to be more science-based. And I'm going to have one more side note to wrap up. And I've been talking about how good this study is. This is the 2013 New England Journal of Medicine Fidelity Study. It's a great study. But there's one problem with this study which I want to leave you thinking about. The biggest problem with this study that I have is that it was published in 2013. 50 years after we started doing arthroscopies for degenerative knees. Why is it that we have to wait for somebody to do a study 50 years after we start doing the operation to find out that it never worked in any one of those 50 years. And I think that needs to change. Thank you. Okay, so we're a bit late, but maybe a couple of questions? I, I, I deliberately ran over so there would be no <laughs> questions. Thank you so much, Ian. Questions? Christine? Thank you very much. I loved your talk. Uh, you said that uh, observation trumps experimentation as if uh, experimentation would provide the truth. I, I think you alluded to the problem that that might not be the case for the randomized trials even in, in surgery, within surgery, but you also said that a new pill would undergo much more rigorous uh, evaluation. But, but to be honest, I'm not sure you're right about that either. I think we put too much emphasis and too much trust into the uh, testing of new drugs. Now, now I've, I've researched in vaccines and I noted you had to make this disclaimer, I'm not an anti-vax, even though I say that the vaccines actually didn't really bring down rates of, of infection. But to be honest, what we've witnessed with the new vaccines being brought to market here has been very poor experimentation in my point of view. For instance, stopping follow-up already after two months leading to these kind of overestimated uh, benefits that were then leading to a, a decline in public trust because it actually turned out that the effect vaccines weren't this effective, you needed repeated doses, the duration wasn't long and so on. So, so just within my field of vaccines, people generally think that this is also another uh, intervention type that is uh, completely B fantastic bias. and always yeah. uh, and we and we actually don't do our homework well enough so i think yes experimentation is needed but we also need to be even more critical about how we do the experimentation mm. oh, yeah. and because you can basically get whatever you want out of your experimentation depending on how you set up your trial exactly and, um, there's a big problem with um, the way we do research and i i hope i got that message across so unfortunately a lot of people uh, and surgeons in particular when I start criticising RCTs, I say, oh, we're not doing them very well, they're biased, uh, there's too much analytical flexibility. I like that term, analytical flexibility in how we analyse the study. Um, they say, yes, that's why it's all rubbish. We don't, we don't need it. And my argument is that, no, we just need to do it better. Um, and um, it's a tool. RCTs, science, is, is a tool to try and help us uh, do something. Um, and if somebody, uh, a carpenter, builds a house badly and it falls down, it's not because of the tools that the carpenter was using. It's because the carpenter used the tools badly. Thank you. Soren? Thank you for a nice presentation, Ian. Always interesting. Um, I know it's a complex thing, but any ideas of how we close this evidence to practice gap? Uh, yeah, well, um, fortunately, fortunately, that's a whole chapter in the book. Um, I will uh, roughly answer that in that I have always been um, of the mind that we should bring, be positive, bring practitioners on the journey with you, uh, educate them, um, and we're trying to, for example, 
uh, raise the uh, clinical epidemiology education levels of orthopaedic trainees in Australia. That's one small step. You know, so that, that kind of thing, involve them in research, then they'll understand the research better. So I've always had this sort of um, carrot rather than stick mentality. I think that's a good way of doing it. But more recently, I think that we need to try more things. Um, and in particular, there's certain financial levers um, in my country, anyway, um, that is driving a lot of overtreatment, and I think it, it needs to be addressed. There's some very perverse incentives. We now have groups of surgeons that own private hospitals. The only way private hospitals make money is with turnover, and I've known examples where surgeons have been kicked out of a practice because they're not operating enough on patients. So things like that have to stop. So I think, I think we need carrots and sticks, is the short answer. Thank you very much for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I'm Karen Sugo from uh, Physical Activity and Health in Working Life Research Unit. And you touched a little bit upon what can we do to become a little bit more preventive with the bariatric and uh, the weight reduction. But could you give the, your thoughts about how to improve the RCT evidence on the preventive part bef to have an approach on health before we need the healthcare system? Yeah, well, it's, this, it's the same um, as the evidence for anything. You need more of it and better quality evidence. And there is, a, unfortunately, you're battling a, a mindset amongst the public and interventionalists like me, the surgeons, um, that discount the effect of prevention and focus their efforts on treatments. Even when we're talking about bariatric surgery to prevent a knee replacement, why are we doing bariatric surgery? Isn't there other things we can do to prevent <laughs> uh, or uh, uh, treat obesity in the first place? Um, but uh, our medical system does not incentivize that, so we do need more research. But I, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to do your research. Thank you very much, Ian. It's been a great pleasure having you here. Very thought-provoking lecture, and thank you all for coming. And there will be a lunch, but I don't know to what extent there will be lunch in the room over there. Is it a first come, first serve basis, or what is Those the? That have signed up. Those oh, who have signed okay. up. Okay, <laughs> so those who have signed up plus another 20. <laughs> okay, thank you. I would like to. Thank you.